I'm having problems because the enemy does not want people in the presence of God. And yesterday I was talking about why it's important to draw near to God. And I shared my testimony of the things that I went through and how I started walking and living like a carnal Christian simply because I did not pick up the habit of consistently walking with God every in my every single day. And so, you know, one day you let it slip and then you don't pick it up the next day. And then, you know, and then you don't pick it up the day after that. Then you don't. And it's very easy to get off course. And so we were talking about drawing near and the power in drawing near and bringing your life into this place where God can constantly get his hands on you. He can constantly speak to you and it's easy for you to hear him. Remember I talked about shrinking back and I said that I was the one that stopped doing what it took to maintain my own spiritual depth. It wasn't my kid's fault. It wasn't my husband, it wasn't my church. It wasn't anybody else. It was me. And so one day in the midst of every me trying to meditate and ponder on what was going on in my life, I was led to Hebrews, the 10th chapter. And when I got to verse number 22, I was sharing with you all that there was two words that stood out to me and those words were draw near. You know, and so with all the words that I found in the book of Hebrews chapter 10, it was only those two words that really changed the course of my life, draw near. And so when the Bible quoted those words, you know, it's, I shared with you all that it was like a king telling somebody, pointing a scepter at someone saying, come approach my throne, come near my throne. And I want to read Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 through 22 to you all, because I think it's important for you to see. And this is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 and 22. He said, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy faith, we've got that confidence by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. So the body of Jesus Christ prepared a way for us to go before the throne of God. And as we make the decision to go before the throne of God, you never have to worry about being rejected because you're going through the body of Jesus Christ. Now, if you walk in there in and of yourself, you can't get in there in and of yourself. Remember, Jesus said, I'm the way, I'm the truth, I'm the light. And no man can come to the Father except they do it through me. And so Jesus, when we go to the throne in prayer, we are going through Christ. And so that song, when he sees me, he sees his righteousness is is very, very true because when he sees you, he sees his son. And so you always want to understand that you are in Christ and because you're in Christ, that's what gives you the right to stand before the father. And so then in verse 22, he said, and since we have a great and high priest, he's our high priest, Jesus is. He said in verse 22, since we have this high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Why are those things important for him to say? It's important for him to to let you know that when you approach the throne of God, when you draw near with a sincere heart and with full assurance that brings faith, your heart is sprinkled because of the blood of Jesus Christ. And so you can come into the presence of God guiltless, free of a guilty conscience, and knowing that your body has been washed with pure water. And how is it done? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. And so there's nothing hindering you or stopping you. I don't care what you've done. When you make up in your mind that you're going to approach the throne of God, you can do it freely. You can do it boldly because Jesus Christ has prepared the way for you to do that. And so when I read this passage, something in my heart shifted. It was as if God was uh, uh, stepping through the pages, if you will, of Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 22, saying to me, Melvin, if you don't like where you are, all you got to do is come back to me. Just draw near and I'll sprinkle your heart. And I'll clean everything that's contaminated, everything that's pulling you away from me. You just get yourself to me. And I love that because it's a simultaneous work. I don't have to go before the throne of God cleaning myself. I don't have to do that. I don't have to say, oh, you know how there's sometimes, you know, when, you know, you get dirt on you and you don't want to go in the house before 
you get the dirt off you, you stumping your feet, doing all that you can to rid yourself of anything that may be contaminated before you walk in the house. You know, let's say if the carpet is clean or whatever, you want to take everything that's dirty off. And God is saying, no, come on in just like you are, because I will cleanse you. It'll kind of be like you take your car through a car wash. You don't, you don't do anything but go through. You sit down, you get in the car, you put the car in neutral, and you go through the car wash. And what happens? The car wash cleanses you. That's the way it is in our position with God and with Jesus Christ. Jesus cleanses us, and he equips us to be able to go before the throne of God so I don't have to clean myself up before I get to him. I get to him, and he does the cleansing. And so in that moment, I made the decision to get back into my place of intimacy with the Father, and then from then on, do everything that I could do to protect it. And so from that day on, it seemed that everywhere I went, God was helping me, drawing me, and giving me these little nuggets that kept me coming into his presence. You know, when I shared with you all about the Western Wall, that was a huge nugget for me to say, just keep coming. Just keep coming into my presence, knowing that God is doing a work in me. And so because my mind was transformed after reading Hebrews, the 22nd uh, chapter 10, verse 22, this is why the word is so critical because it was the word that gave me another way of thinking. And had the word not given me another way of thinking, I would have gotten under condemnation because I wasn't in my heart where I knew I desired to be or where I wanted to be. And so what was happening? My mind was transformed after reading Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, and my heart had turned in God's direction. I became hungry again for everything that God had. I became hungry for God himself, hungry to hear his voice, hungry to know him, hungry to experience his love and his presence in my life. And I know that that's where many of you are. That's why you started coming on Fresh Big Man a lot. That's why you started joining me at the 6 a.m. prayer line. Why? Because you're hungry for the things of God in your life. And so my life wanted to live. My heart wanted to live. And it still does perpetually in the presence of God. That's where I just, I, I thrive in the presence of God. You know, you get some people that thrive in certain environments. Athletes, they thrive when there's a big crowd around them and whatnot. I thrive in the presence of God. And I shared with you all that, you know, because of that, I would go around praying people and I would get whoever was praying. I wanted to be near them because what it did is it continually created a hunger in my heart to seek God, to go after him. Do I live my life from day to day? Yes, I live my life from day to day, but I live my life conscious of God's presence on me. You know, I thought about Smith Wigglesworth. He was a powerful man of God. He had four documented cases of people being raised from the dead in his ministry. And one of the things that he said is he said, I would rather have the presence of God on my life for five minutes than to have the world with a fence around it. Something to that effect. I would rather have the presence of God on my life for five minutes than to have the world with the fence around it. Me too. But it takes discipline. And you have to be committed to it. Now, his presence is with us. His presence is on us. And it will be on us eternally because God said he would never leave us or forsake us. But I'm talking about living conscious of God's presence and then keeping your life in a place where you're consistently sensitive to the way that to where God is and to who God is in your life. And so if we go back to Hebrews chapter 10 and we look at verse number 38 we'll see that not everybody runs to the presence of God. Some people pull away from the presence of God for different reasons. One, because they feel like, you know, the world has more to offer them because they haven't got a revelation of, of who God is, how good he is, and the things that he offers. You know, when you get a taste of how good God really is, you will never hunger again for the things of the world. The challenge is, is that many people have been fed religion and because they've been fed religion, they don't really get to taste and see that the Lord is good. And so God said he doesn't want us drawing back because when we draw back, he doesn't get pleasure out of our life. He said, I don't get any pleasure. This is what it said. He said, now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall not have pleasure in him. What does, what does that mean? It means that God is not gonna get the pleasure out of fellowshipping with you, out of spending time with you. And I shared this with you yesterday. He loves you. And his desire is to spend as much time with you as he possibly can. 
but that's that means that he's always conscious of you but you are not always living conscious of him and he wants you to live in your everyday no matter what it is that you're doing when you're in the drive through at chick-fil-a he wants you to be conscious of his presence conscious of his favor resting on your life and so the bible says in he hebrews 10 38 and 39 it says we're not of them that draw back that's not me that's not my life i don't draw back you know and they drew back in the wilderness they drew back unto perdition you, and then it says but of them that believe to the saving of the soul we don't draw back we draw near we go into god we march into him we're not allowing lifestyles uh, mess ups and habits and problems and challenges i don't let them keep me out of the presence of god and again, I said this to you yesterday, that may be the difference between you and somebody else, that I realize the grace of God is made manifest in my life. And because I'm conscious of, I'm very conscious of the righteousness that I am and the grace of God that sits on my life. And because I live with that consciousness, even when I make a mistake, I will not let that mistake make me. I will not allow the mistakes of my life to govern how I live or govern how I move in front of God. When I mess up, I go before God and I own it. Yep, I did that. And I'm sorry that I did that. I shouldn't have done that. So what I'm asking you to do, Father, is give me a greater consciousness of your word. Give me a greater consciousness of your presence so that when I'm tempted to do things that are out of alignment with your will, I will lean more to doing the things that are in alignment with your will. And so grace is there. Grace is there to walk with you. Grace is there to protect you. Grace is there to love you and to show you where God's heart is when you've made a mistake. Jesus has dealt with your mistakes. You don't have to deal with them. Jesus has already dealt with them. And so Paul, who is believed to be the writer of the big book of Hebrews, said two things. He said that we're to live by faith. And he said that God takes no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. What this means is that when we're walking with God, doing our best to cultivate his presence there's going to be times when your faith is going to be tested because you're going to have to do this by faith you're going to have to draw near by faith when you've made a mistake you're going to have to believe that you have access consistently 24 hours a day seven days a week to the presence of god and that you have a right to approach the throne of god even when you don't feel like you do when the enemy comes to your mind and he's done this to all of us when he's come to your mind to convince you that you don't have a right to stand before the throne of God, it is a lie. No matter what you've done, it is a lie to believe that you don't have a right to approach the throne of God. That's why when people tell sinners, God don't hear your prayers, that's not true. Now that may have been true under the old covenant, but it is not true under the new covenant. If it was the truth under the new covenant, sinners would never be able to come into relationship with God. He does hear the cry of the sinner and he will move on behalf of a sinner because the Bible says that his, his, his mercy hovers over all of us. His grace is there for anybody that will tap into it. That's the beauty of grace. That's the beauty of, of the cross and everything that Jesus did to die and, and, and save us is that when we mess up, we can make up, but we don't have to give up. And so living in the presence of God is done independent of your feelings, it's independent of your emotions, and it's totally dependent upon your faith. You cannot walk with God and depend on anything exterior to confirm or deny his power or his presence in your life. You cannot do it. And so in times when you don't feel like God hears you or that he's with you by faith, you have to know that he does love you, that he does hear you and that he is with you and this comes by spending time meditating on the word of god transforming your thought life so that you're always thinking the way that god thinks when times of discouragement or times of disappointment come you know a mind that hasn't been transformed to the word of god is going to draw back instead of drawing near and so god gave us a lot of tools and all of those tools are designed to keep you spiritually strong and so, you know, we need to focus on your prayer life, your word life, your love life, and your worship life. Those four things will keep you in the presence of God. And, you know, those are the four things that I'm always paying attention to in my life. My prayer life, where am I? How am I praying? Am I constantly talking to God? And I'm going to tell you, I, I talk to God all the time. 
It is just a lifestyle that I have adapted. And even when I'm not getting on my knees, I'm constantly talking to God. When I'm washing dishes, I'm talking to God. And I'm in the shop, I'm talking to God constantly. And you know what? Even when I'm making mistakes, in the midst of me making mistakes, I'm talking to God. Because I've trained myself to perpetually be conscious of God's presence. My worship life. I'm always listening to something that keeps me thinking up and drawing my heart and my life up. That's what you need. You need to constantly be drawing your life up where you're thinking about the Father, worshiping Him. You know, and I'm not talking about songs that are filled with religion. I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about uh, uh, songs where I sing to you and you sing to me, those songs that are are horizontal versus them being vertical. I'm talking about singing songs that magnify who God is and that keep the reality of who he is in your mind and in your soul. Songs that have you honoring God for what he's done in your life, for being the creator of all heaven and earth. You know, I'm talking about songs that make him big in your life, bigger than your circumstances, bigger than what's going on around you, bigger than how you're currently living. That's what I'm talking about songs of worship that adore him, you know, and then your love life. You got to keep your eyes on your love life because your love life is your God life. And, and, you know, the Bible says we know that God and love, they're synonymous. They're wet and water. You cannot separate love and God. They're one and the same. You know, we joke about it, but we say you don't go into a restaurant and say, give me a glass of water and hold the wet. No, you understand that when you get the water, wet is coming with the water. But when you get God, love is coming with God. And when you get God, when you get love, uh, God is coming with love. That's the way it is. And you cannot ever separate the two because the Bible says God is love. And so when you're cultivating your love life, when you have opportunities to walk in strife, bitterness, and offense, and instead you choose the way of love, you have chosen God himself. That's so important for you all to know that when somebody hurts you, somebody make you mad, when instead of being in strife or using your words to speak against that person, you go to the father and you talk to the father and you ask the father for, how would you do this? How would you handle this? And then he shows you how he would handle it. And then you walk out that way. What you've done is you've just stepped yourself, your life up a notch. You've attended to higher things and God's grace is going to be made manifest in your life. And then he's going to be the one. You empower God to be the one to give vengeance for you. You don't have to seek after the vengeance. God is going to do what he needs to do. And I want to share this because one day I was talking to the Lord about that scripture that says that uh, we would heap coals when somebody offends a believer, that you heap coals on their head if they offend you. I used to think that that scripture meant that God was going to burn them up, that he was going to beat them up, that he was going to do something bad or something bad was going to happen in their life. But as I continued to study that out, the Lord said to me, that is not what I'm saying, because I want them to be whole just like I want you to be whole. And so when you've been offended by somebody, what I will do, heaping coals means that I'm going to burn such a consciousness in their minds of, of how they have stepped out of my love that something in their heart is going to shift and turn in your direction. That's what it means. It means that when they go to bed at night, they're going to be thinking about how they offended you. Even if they don't come to you, it does not mean that God is not dealing with them. And this is especially true for other believers, that they go to bed and you, your, their minds will be shifting towards you. You know, and there are times when I didn't realize that I wounded somebody and God, he's heaping coals on my head. What is he doing? He's giving me a consciousness of what I did and what I said. And then what will I do? I'll pick up that phone and say, I didn't do something right. I didn't do this right. And I'm sorry. I, I wounded you and I'm asking you to forgive me. And I've asked for forgiveness and I've had times where they didn't receive it. You know, there's nothing that I can do about that. But the heaping of the coals, I want you to understand, it's not God going to somebody and beating them up because he loves them just like he loves you. And this is a revelation of the character of God. A lot of times we, we misrepresent God because we think that he's like man. And when we say we use words like vengeance and revenge, we think vengeance is revenge. That's not what it is. Vengeance means that God is going to do what's necessary to take care of you in that situation. And he's going to make sure that you are taken care of and that you, that the person understands 
that you have been wounded. He's going to do all that he can to make sure that that person understands they wounded you. Now, whether they come back to you or not, that's an act of their will. I hope you all hear what I'm saying. I hope you understand what I'm saying. But God doesn't deal with man like we deal with man. He's not like us. His way is always going to be the way of love. And so as you're cultivating your prayer life, as you're cultivating your life in the word, as you're doing what's necessary, you will see that God is moving you into a place and into a space that cultivates his life in your life. He wants you walking with him in a very powerful way. And this is how it's done. Don't draw back, draw near, you know, and just know this. I'm praying for you. And God has great things for you all. As some of you, you've drawn back away from the Father. And because you've drawn away from the Father, there's information, there's wisdom, there's knowledge, there's blessings, there's favor. There's things that he wants to give to you that you are forfeiting because you're too far from him in your soul and in your behavior. Your heart is connected to God. There is no doubt about that. But get the rest of your life in alignment. Bring all of you back to the Father. Bring your soul, your way of thinking. Bring your body. Offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto him. And bring your heart. So your heart, your mind, your emotions, all of it. Bring it back to the Father. And I'm telling you, your life will be transformed in the ways that will bring joy to your life and be a blessing to somebody else. I hope I said something today that has increased you, that's uh, birthed something in your heart, and that's created a desire in you to get back to where you know that you need to be. The Bible talks about getting back to your first love. God is your first love, whether you realized it or not. He loved you before you loved him. And before sin came in your life, you were in relationship with God when you were in heaven. He has always been your first love. And so get back to him. Love you guys. We'll pray with you tomorrow. Bye-bye.